Hi guys, this is Steve, V6WZ. In this video, I'm going to show how I built and installed my new BOG receive system. I'll explain how I install the wires in the field, my termination method, and specifically about this unique trans-impedance amplifier I use at the feed point of each wire. To my knowledge, no one's ever used an amp like this in a beverage system. These amps not only lift the gain, but they also stabilize the antenna impedance and phase for use in my phased arrays. And in fact, I'm going to talk about my broadside pairs and a BSEF, a broadside N-fire four element uh, array of these same elements. I've been using this RX system of 12 wires in the field now for two winter seasons, and they've honestly exceeded my expectations. Look, over the past 30 years, I've had a lot of different receive antennas. I've used a system of 15 elevated, conventional, 1,000-foot beverage wires, various 9-circle active uh, vertical arrays, EWEs, flags, loops, N-fire vertical pairs, low dipoles, and so on. And to be fair, I honestly had low expectations for these BOGs. I mean, perhaps at best I was hoping they would be uh, close to my elevated wires. And later, I'll talk more about the performance and how I evaluated these BOGs using my multiple RBN skimmer SDR radios and some field testing I did flying a signal source under my drone. I'll show how that data compares to my modeling. Look, the full story is I wouldn't have built this system if it weren't for the constant maintenance nightmare of my four kilometers of beverage wires. Yes, that's over 13,000 feet or two and a half miles of above ground wires running through my very old growth forest. Now, these old tired trees were constantly falling down after every windstorm and I was out with my chainsaw cutting the trees down. It literally became unmanageable. So it seemed to me that putting the wires on or near the ground uh, would be a solution. Based on the positive results from this new BOG system, all of my above ground wires are now removed. Here's a pile of about two miles of fence wire. Let's get started. Obviously every location is going to be different and what I've done here may not work for you, but perhaps you can get some ideas if you want to give it a try. A BOG is usually, well, on the ground. That's why they call it a BOG. However, a paper written by Rudy Severns, N6LF, published in both QST and QEX in 2016, uh, motivated me to install my wires slightly above the ground. Rudy's paper explains how the performance of a bog can deteriorate over time as the wire sinks into the ground and gets covered by overgrowth. It seems that the closer proximity to the ground will drastically alter the current taper along the wire and cause it to self-terminate rapidly. I'll include a link to the paper in the description below this video. My wires are 3 to 400 feet long and elevated about 4 to 6 inches above the ground by stapling an insulated 14 gauge wire to logs laid end to end on the forest floor. This is easy for me to do since this old growth forest is littered with dead trees. Yeah, like lots of deadfall. So my beverages are really a BOL, a beverage on a log. Look, sure, it's not pretty. I mean, it's not perfectly symmetric and straight as the wires undulate and twist through the forest floor. The logs are not perfect insulators and will deteriorate with time. But guys, we aren't building a violin. We aren't sending a manned mission to Mars. We aren't building a 5 gigahertz system here. We're dealing with 160 meters. That means, well, the wavelength is 160 meters long. These small variations won't make much difference. And yes, over time the logs will sink and the overgrowth will take over, but nothing is zero maintenance, and it's not hard to go for a walk and get some exercise, check the wires, reposition some logs, fix some staples, etc. Oh, the animals will wreck them. Well, I have lots of deer. I mean lots. I also have moose and I have bear on my land. So far the deer or moose have only chewed on one wire. I haven't seen that they've tripped or disrupted any of the logs. Well, at least for the last two years. 
The only issue so far has been a bear that ripped a bucket off one of the feed point amps and was playing with it. He punctured the plastic with its claws, or teeth, just like it was tissue paper. Again, look, no field installation is going to be zero maintenance. It's part of being a ham. We're always fixing stuff. Go for a walk, get some exercise, check the wires, you'll live longer, you'll work more DX. I use number 14 gauge house wire. Most building supply houses sell it affordably in thousand foot spools. DX Engineering sells this stranded wire that is good too, but I think the deer might break it quicker if they chew on it. Solid might be more robust, I'm not sure. I put the wire in a spool holder, and after laying out the logs, I just run it out and use a staple gun with half inch staples to hold the wire in place. By the way, I use Google Earth to help lay out the beverages. I use my compass in my iPhone for uh, finding the direction. And I'll also use a 300 foot field measuring tape to help estimate the length. If you want later, you could do some TDR work with your analyzer to get a more accurate uh, measurement of the length. For the termination and feed point grounds, I use half inch water pipe. Home centers sell 12 foot lengths. For the termination, I cut four three footers, and for the feed point, I cut three four footers. I use a map torch to solder the connecting wire to the pipe. I buy one of these uh, self starting types from the home building centers. You know, don't even bother using a regular propane torch. I find these map torches make real quick work of the solder, uh, even outside. The wire is terminated with a 320 ohm resistor. I just use a small 1 watt carbon comp type. I used to fuss about using ceramic devices to withstand lightning, but now I just solder a gas discharge tube across the resistor and solder it directly between the wire and the ground rod. A bit of black tape and I hide it under a log. Usually, that is most guys, will feed their BOGs just like an above ground beverage with a passive matching transformer. The transformer is built to match the 300 ohm surge impedance of the wire to the 75 or 50 ohm coax. This would be three turns on a, the 75 ohm side and six turns on the 300 ohm side using a binocular core as shown here. However, a BOG output can be rather low and often require some preamplification. This can be done on the low impedance side in the shack just before the radio. However, my system uses a unique trans impedance amplifier at the feed point. This is a modification of a design by John W1FV that uses a high performance surface mount device op amp. It's designed for very low noise and high dynamic range and is optimized for 160 and 80 meters. In another video, I'm going to describe the amplifier in more detail, provide some construction detail, as well as a link to order some PCBs if you want to make your own. Again, the link to that video will be in the description below. The benefit of using these amps is to stabilize the amplitude, phase, and impedance. In any phased array, using coax as delay lines, it's crucial that the feed lines have a low SWR. You see, if the feed point is mismatched to the coax line, then the phase delays can be way off. The output of these amps at the coax connector will always be exactly 75 ohms, no matter what's happening on the wire. The trade-off using these amps is the vulnerability that all active electronics suffer outside, especially from lightning. My design uses gas discharge tubes and a disable relay shorting the input when not in use, but they're not indestructible. Certainly a passive feed point using a transformer will be more robust, but I think these amplifiers are a game changer for perking up the output, especially in a phased array. At the feed point, I drive in a 4 foot copper pipe and leave 10 inches or so above ground that I can zip tie the amp to. These amps are looking for a very high source impedance, so a long ground rod or good ground soil is not required. You could also use a separate stake to mount the amp on. I buy these cheap plastic buckets from the building store and cover the feed point. I paint them camo color. 
You'll notice the amps have a separate 12 volt supply. I've done this to avoid putting DC on the coax with a bias T because I've discovered this can sometimes lead to noise problems. I use CAT5 for the supply voltage to the field. Make sure you get direct burial CAT5 as well as direct burial coax. Also, cover your coax and CAT wires under logs or bury them. Trenching can be a lot of work and often difficult when there's roots. Deer will eat coax and cat 5 wire. Covering them with logs works very well. By the way, keep those F connectors clean and tighten them with a wrench. Flood your connectors with silicon grease to prevent moisture ingress. Together with my 9 circle array and other receive antennas, I have over 50 RG6 connectors in the field. Usually, if I'm seeing a noise or other RX antenna problem, the most likely culprit is a loose or faulty F connector. Okay, so how do these short 300 foot wires stapled to logs actually perform? Well, first of all, have you heard the expression, hearing or working DX is never proof of a good antenna? Yeah, well, that's actually a true statement. However, this is my second winter DX season using these BOGs. I found switching between the full-sized above ground wires and the BOGs usually showed very little difference in copy, both on 160 meters and medium wave. A somewhat less subjective analysis is using the RBN system. Perhaps some of you are aware of my RBN skimmer spots. I have three active skimmer radios a QS1R 9-band radio, and two SDRIQ radios that I can switch to any RX antenna for comparison. These show up on the RBN network as V6WZ, V6WZ1, and V6WZ2. The SNRs were usually within a dB or so when comparing the full-size beverages and the BOGs. Perhaps the least subjective evaluation is to take some field measurements and compare them to modeling. I built a small clock oscillator source that I can fly under my drone. This one is a dual transmitter for 160 meters and 1.2 megahertz, the medium wave broadcast band. I made another video about these little transmitters if you want to build your own. I'll put a link in the description below for that. I fly the drone out to one kilometer at an elevation that will be close to a 15 degree wave angle and take measurements. I fly to eight compass directions and switch through all of the antennas at each stop. I have the ability to select single wires or any phased pair, so all, all together there are 13 measurements taken at each drone stop. In Excel I tabulate and normalize the data to a common azimuth and then plot each wire or pair on a polar plot together with the modeled azimuth pattern for that same antenna, which I also ran at a 15 degree wave angle. Although I plot each individual wire or phased pair, I've also averaged all of the wires uh, into one polar plot, which seems to smooth out some of the anomalies. Anyway, here is a single wire on 160 meters, with the drone data plotted with the red dots and line. Notice the pronounced side rejection. I see this on all of the wires. It seems that modeling doesn't properly account for this with the wires so close to the ground. Here's a broadside pair spaced at 400 feet. Sure, I only have eight data points with this drone data, but it agrees pretty closely to the model. Perhaps next year I'll do more drone stops and fill in the gaps. Either way, the modeled RDF for this array is almost 13 dB, which is pretty decent for only 300 foot long elements. Now, here is my BSEF 4 element array, and clearly this needs work. It seems the end fire pairs are not performing as expected to provide that strong front to back. In fact, this is a plot of just the individual end fire pairs. Obviously, the front to back is not developed. My end fire pairs are staggered at 70 feet and properly phased using the crossfire feed method, but I suspect there is either a phase or amplitude imbalance between the wires that upsets the nulling. 
Perhaps these wires close to the ground are subject to too much variability to be suitable for end fire phasing. I ran out of season this year to do more experiments. But hey, this is exactly why field measurements are important. Here are the same results for medium wave. With only 400 foot broadside spacing, these uh, pairs don't achieve the same RDF as they would with wider spacing. However, for 300 foot long wires, they're still pretty effective antennas. BOGs are not a new thing. They've been in use for decades, so there isn't a lot new here. However, I wouldn't have made this video if the performance for these guys didn't surprise me. The broadside pairs can hear just as well as my old thousand foot elevated pairs. Maybe you got some ideas from my experimenting and you might want to try a similar setup. These stealthy wires lying close to or on the ground can be deployed in a lot of situations where above ground wires just aren't possible. Perhaps you already have a BOG installation and you might want to try building some of these trans impedance amps to lift the gain a bit and perk up the output. Check out my part 2 video with some construction details about these amps. 73, this is Steve. V6WZ.